Hello, everyone. So um, apologies if I'm going to say things that I may have already said before uh, when I was on with Mark Roberts just now. Um, I've got a presentation for you here um, just to take you through um, our experience uh, with bulk wine and e-commerce. Um, the title for, of this presentation uh, was in, the, in the program is The Saviour Table for Bulk Wine Business. And I've, I was thinking, what is a saviour table? Is it like a table with Jesus on it or something? Um, and then I just took table out. So if, if it is an important phrase, I'm sorry for missing it out. So uh, my name is Andrew Porton. Um, I started a company uh, in 2008 called The Wine Fusion um, with, with a colleague of mine called Christopher Smith, who's no longer with the business. Um, and about 10, 10 years later, we sold a majority shareholding of our company to the Lanchester Group, which is how I came into uh, the, the, uh, the company of Mark Roberts and, and uh, the other 500 or so people who work at Lanchester Group. So we've been doing our thing since 2008, um, creating intelligent contemporary wines. Um, it, it, we, Chris and I were working for a company called Orbital Wines, which did some pretty edgy marketing um, around about that time with a product called Stormhook. So Stormhook was uh, the first wine brand that had an online blogging um, marketing uh, uh, approach. We actually grew the, black, the brand through the blogosphere. It was the first time that had been done. We had a product um, called Camden Park. Subsequently, those, uh, those products ended up with Origin and uh, Chris and I um, started Wine Fusion with the view of, of taking some of the creative spirit of our former job and bringing it to, to, to the fore in our own business. So that's how it all started. Um, about three years into our business, we, we were producing some quite unusual wines and some quite different blends. We had, we had a bottling uh, program for quite eclectic regional wines from Italy, as an example. We produced a, an open source product uh, for Virgin Wines, who are over here. Um, called Cordis Vinum, also in Italy. So we actually did, created an online platform and allowed uh, members of the public to actually vote on aspects of the winemaking and have direct influence on the products. And at that point, we thought to ourselves, God, we really should define our business because um, it's going somewhere and we need some definition. And some guy came in and said, oh, your wines are very intelligent and they're very contemporary. So we branded ourselves you know, intelligent contemporary wines. And I suppose intelligent wines are wines that are responsive to what people want to drink, responsive to um, a, a need. Uh, they're not wines that are produced just, you know, willy-nilly and just foisted on people. We're trying to produce things that people actually want in their lives. What makes a wine contemporary? Um, you know, attuned to modern tastes, whatever that may be. It may be visual taste, it may be um, uh, actual t uh, taste in the glass. And um, that's, that's where we've come from. It's been a long journey, um, and I was just reflecting earlier with Mark Roberts about how the bulk wine industry has changed hugely since 2008 even. Um, in, you know, in 2008, we were scrambling around trying to start this business, and we were trying to find some Cabernet from California and some Shiraz from Australia. And um, that was kind of it. And now look at where we are. We've got a room full of uh, eclectic, um, really exciting wines and more and more coming on stream all the time. So it's an industry that's changed enormously. Um, E-commerce um, is, is an area that Wine Fusion is very uh, heavily involved with. Um, Virgin Wines, in, in, in that respect, is, is a company that, that we've been um, partnering with uh, for many, many years, and we've, we've been together on, on quite a journey. But as a sector, especially now, it is wine's rising star. Um, there are various stats around for this, but I, I did read one that across 10 core markets, which includes the UK, Australia, and the US, as well as Brazil and a few others, it is outgrowing the overall wine market by up to 30 percentage points. Um, and then along came COVID. Um, so you can't do anything anymore. You're locked, you're locked down. What do you do? Well, after you've burned down the kitchen with your culinary experiments, you go online and you fill a case with 12 bottles or maybe even 15 or throw in some spirits as well. They arrive, you have this moment with the case, it's got beautiful text on it, and you think, 
wow, look at, look at this, this I, I want this thing, this is great. You pull out each bottle lovingly, you know, whilst you look at the BBC news, all the bad news in the background, and you open the box and, and you go, oh, look at this. Oh, this is one for the weekend. I'll put that over there. Oh, this one, this one, look, this will go well with my chicken tonight. Um, the, it's cold chicken, because obviously I burned down the kitchen. I'll put that one over here. And, um, you know, online has, has filled um, a niche in, in where people have wanted something new, wanted some adventure, and online wine has given that to them. Um, obviously, the growth in the industry has levelled off a bit, but the evidence seem to, seems to be the case that people are staying and people are liking the experience. They like the convenience as well as not having to lug um, a case of wine around, which is a pr pretty, pretty uh, heavy thing. Um, and in the UK, it is estimated that online will be 50% larger as a sector in 2024 than it was in 2019. So what makes a successful online wine? So here are some pointers um, from things that, my experience, things that we've done. Visual impact. It's, a, it's an amazing thing what you can do with online wine. You, you have the ability to do pretty much anything you want. If you want to sell wine in a supermarket or sell wine in, in, in a more traditional arena, you have to design within certain norms. But online, you can, you can do pretty much anything. And you need, just need to create something where somebody goes, I want this in my life. Provenance. This wine is special because, uh, therefore, I'm special too. You know, I'm buying into this thing that's made by this winemaker who looks like a pretty cool guy. I want to have him over for dinner. Um, this looks like a nice place. I, I feel like I could fit in there on holiday. It's, the wine is special. It makes you feel special. Personality, I've already covered that. Um, I think when you, when you talk about personalities of winemakers in the context of online selling, people... Um, that they latch on to, it, to, to that person. I think that, they, that there's a lot of personalities in the wine industry, and people like people like that. They, they find them interesting. Exclusivity. This is something that online does very well. Um, these wines are blended exclusively. They are um, they put into packages that are totally exclusive. You can't buy them anywhere else. And you can create mini cults around brands on online platforms there are, there are brands like Black Stump in Lathwaite's or um, Black Pig in Virgin Wines where people are looking for the next, next fix of this. Um, and open source wines as well. I mean, we, we, you can engage online. There have been various things that um, I, I've been involved with where people, um, they pay for wine in advance. It's delivered um, 12 weeks down the track. There's um, communication that can happen about how a wine is made. It's a, it's a real uh, arena where you can get real engagement. Um, and scarcity. Um, we can do exclusively, uh, exclusive and scarce in the, bulk, in the bulk wine arena. Two and a half thousand cases is a 24,000 litre tank. It's, uh, we don't talk about the tank, but two and a half thousand cases is not really a lot of wine in the grand scheme of things. My present, my my uh, my formatting has gone a bit up the wall. And apologies for this. Um, how can a wine be produced in bulk? Um, do all this? I guess that's what it says. Um, it's surprisingly easy. Um, so visual impact. It can be designed any way, any way you like. Provenance. All bulk wines have provenance. Personality. And there are now dedicated bulk producers who love to be associated with their wines. Whereas in the past, bulk was an arena to get rid of things that were a bit of a problem, or it was a commercial necessity. Now it's something that is attracting people who want to be associated with their products. Exclusivity, we can create exclusive wines all day long through this, through this platform, um, through this way of working. And scarcity, like I've just said, 2,500 cases is... is uh, is, is not a huge commercial blend, and it's totally possible to achieve through the online, uh, through the bulk, uh, UK bottling or non-source bottling model. It also allows us to focus on the parts that matter to the consumer, not the parts that don't. Um, uh, too often, estate-produced wines do not take the needs of the consumer into account. Private label wines sourced via the bulk model, however, certainly can. Um, you know. 
people are interested in, does it look good? Is this an appealing, compelling story? Is the price point attractive? And overall, and the big thing, does this taste nice? And the thing that's, that online allows us to do through all the ratings that, that, that these producers, are, the, these, these online platforms are getting all the time, is the big thing for Virgin Wines. They buy according to what people like. So, um, you know, you, get, you end up with a wine that, that is getting five stars off of hundreds of reviews. That says something about the style of wine. It's, it shows that it works, and it shows that you need to build on that. Um, sustainability bulks something. It's, uh, sustainability is uh, bulks trump card, I think I put underneath that, uh, that thing. Um, as we've covered off already, the model is not only better for the consumer, it's better for the planet as well. Um, we've, we've got the most sustainable production model, and we've known it for many, many years, but now it's, it's extremely topical and it's extremely important. Um, I think that in the trade, in the past, there may have been buyers who might turn their noses up at bulk. I think that that's pretty rare now. Um, consumer perceptions. I think people are more concerned about whether a wine is organic or vegan or even things like, you know, it, it, do I like the look of it, than whether it's got a code like W1740 on the back which shows that it's produced in the UK. I don't think that people are um, that interested in it. But um, like I said in my, in my uh, discussion with Mark, um, sustainability in wine, the, me the message is, is something that we need to work on because I don't think that people perceive that wine is unsustainable. So why are you trying to fix a problem that they don't perceive as a problem? And without our model, can some of the bold corporate sustainability commitments that are being made in the trade be achieved? I would say that they can't. I mean, the Wine Society has made uh, a very bold um, sustainability commitment, and they've made it very fast um, uh, immediately after the, the Glasgow conference. And, and what, what buyers there are going is saying is, you know, how, there's an awful lot of wine that, that goes through this business that can never be truly sustainable. Um, so that's an interesting one for them. So, E-commerce is also a smart channel for bulk producers. That's what it says underneath there. And I would say that um, it, en it enables uh, bulk producers to build healthier business over the longer term. Um, I think that online partners, online clients are generally less promiscuous. They want to build relationships with bulk producers who share their vision, who give them access to the good stuff every vintage, who are consistent from a quality perspective, and who are um, happy to work with, with those uh, producers, with, with, with those online platforms to build a story and to build a personality around those wines. They are keen to build over the longer term, as I've said. Um, a lot of these people are happy to commit in advance and understand the importance of committing in advance. Um, it's not just about paying the lowest price possible. I think people are happy to pay a fair price and offer more, uh, more premium options, the ability to build premium bulk business as well. Um, and they are able to work with smaller volumes, which is, you know, as we all know, trying to source tanks and tanks and tanks of wine, many hundreds of thousands of litres or more or millions, is difficult. But, um, you know, there's a lot of producers here who have a tank of this or a couple of tanks of that. And online is a great channel for those wines. So the e-commerce sector builds profound value for producers as much as it does for consumers, in my view. Um, and that's me. Um, we're always looking to work uh, with wine producers who like, who like what we do. Um, but that's a little introduction to e-commerce from a bulk perspective. OK, so um, I'm Felicity Carter. And as you've heard, I'm now executive editor of an American group called Pix.Wine, which is a um, yeah, how do you actually progress this? Sorry. The arrows. Are you on the uh -huh. No? This is an interesting presentation, I promise. Oh, thank you. 
So thank you. Okay, got it now. Okay, so um, basically, Pickstop Wine is when it will launch next year is a search engine that if you're in the United States, it's it's like the Booking.com of wine. If you're looking for a wine, you can put it in and you can you can find it. Who who stocks it? Where are they? How much do they cost? Which sounds ridiculously simple. Except it turns out it's extremely difficult um, for a whole bunch of technical reasons. But um, inside the United States, e-commerce, I've discovered, is an absolute nightmare, particularly when compared to Europe. But it's growing. So um, the Silicon Valley Bank said that um, online is now the greatest opportunity for producers in 2021, was talking about the United States. As for why it's so bad, it's because um, the United States started building all of its websites much earlier than everybody else did. So they've, so many wine retailers have websites that were built 20 years ago, which they've constantly been improving. And of course, the technology of 20 years ago is much worse than the technology of today. And so um, Europe actually has Eli, uh, online commerce, which is much better and much more seamless, simply because it has been, bought, uh, been built much, uh, much more recently. However, this is all changing very rapidly. Now, when it comes to private label, this is changing as well, and it's offering a lot of opportunities that haven't been seen before inside the United States market. So the first private label wine really in the US was something called Two Buck Chuck, which was uh, put out by Trader Joe's, and it was sold, it was California wine sold for about $2. So, um, of course, private label wine had existed, but it had never been part of the US market in the same way that it had been in the UK or in, in Europe, where private label now makes up between 30 and 50% of the entire wine market. But so this was the first time that there was a clearly, obviously branded wine, and it opened the floodgates for private wine. So now, um, and the, the second thing that happened was Aldi went into the United States, and it brought its private label business with it as well. Um, and uh, although private label had always been associated with very poor quality wine, Aldi has changed things, and now they do things like this, their wine advent calendar, which is now a collectible. It gets sold out really, really fast. This is a story that we did about it on our website. We have a magazine called The Drop, which is next to the search engine. So in 2020s, just to show how much things had changed, there's a, a competition called Product of the Year. It started in France. It's now done in 40 countries where about 40,000 consumers in those markets vote on the products that they liked the most. And in 2020, one of the products that came out the best was Aldi's home brand Cabernet Sauvignon. So the market has really changed and, and retailers and hospitality groups are beginning to see the possibilities in private label. But they have an issue, which is that Consumers in the United States largely still want to know about provenance. They want to know who is behind it. And so home label, buyer's own brand, private label hasn't had the traction it has elsewhere because people are still like, where does it come from? They don't have the confidence of, say, UK consumers who are used to very posh stores like Harrods and Fortnum Masons who have buyers who, who do, uh, you know, Fortnum's own brand or Harrods own brand, which are very trustworthy products. So the question of who is behind these brands is still something of an issue. But they're beginning to solve it like this. This is a collaboration between Michael Mondavi, who's head of a, a distribution import group called Folio Fine Wine Partners, and also he's got the famous Mondavi name, and the Hyatt. So they have, between them, built a brand called Canvas, where the names of the people associated with the brand owners is much more important than the wine's provenance at where it comes from. So here, the name Michael Mondavi is much more important than what's in the bottle. The next thing we've seen in the last couple of years is the rise of celebrity winemaking. So celebrities have just discovered that they can make a mozza if they go out and get their own wine brand. So last year, Cameron Diaz did this with a brand called Aveline. Um, Julian Ho, I think her name is, who was in um, a vampire series on HBO, um, has started a, a wine called Fresh Fine, which is claimed to be better for you. It's got lower sugar, it's got lower carbohydrates, it's got wonderful things it'll do for you if you drink it. And she has has just filed for an IPO, meaning initial public offering, so she's looking to raise millions of dollars to launch this brand. So the private label sector has gone from being non-existent to suddenly being very, very big business. The biggest of them all is a company called Wink. 
which was founded a couple of years ago, and it is a data-driven technology online wine company. So basically what they do is they mine um, user data to look at micro-trends all the time, and then they launch wines made from bulk wine, it's private label wines, to satisfy that trend, which they then sell online. Now this is absolutely enormous. As I put up there, they raised $5.3 million in equity crowdfunding in 2020, but that's only the start of their ambitions. They're currently um, looking for something like $20 million from the, um, from the private equity industry. So this is very much where wine in the United States is going. And in fact, as Stephen from the Rabobank says, um, we've been hearing more that more of the market is being taken over by private label and private label is moving into higher price points. But there's a problem. United States consumers still want transparency. They still ask questions about where things come from. And so the more successful this sector gets, the more scrutiny it's under. Now, in the last couple of weeks, the New York Times wrote an article that was this. The open secret behind many trendy wine clubs overpriced mediocre wines. And in that article, they said most of these new wine clubs are using bulk wine. And they specifically said bulk wine is the sort of the leftover wine that other people don't want or it's poor quality wine. So um, there's going to be more of this and more of sort of um, people talking about bulk wine and what bulk wine actually is. In fact, I'm here at this, um, uh, this gathering this weekend so that I can write an article for my magazine about what is bulk wine, where does it come from, who makes it. So there's an enormous opportunity inside the United States um, for anybody who can get past the horrible regulatory system that they have um, to create private labels. There's going to be more of it. There's going to be more hospitality groups doing it because they can see the profitability. There's going to be more celebrities who want their own wine brand. There's going to be more sports stars that want their own wine brand. So there's going to be more of this. And of course, somebody has to supply the wine. So this is my final takeaways. Private label. It's going to grow. Um, I think one of the stories about bulk wine that has never been told, that I think is time it, it did get told, is about how many co-ops in Europe produce bulk wine and the, the social background to cooperatives, which you know during the 50s and 60s were, were created because they kept people on the land. I think there's a really good story to be told about the collective winemaking that can sometimes result in bulk wine. There's going to be far more of these partnerships where the, the name of the celebrity or the company that's on the bottle will render the origin of the wine irrelevant. But above all, emphasise sustainability. So sustainability is going to be, as we've heard all through this week, is going to be increasingly important. So that's my short trip through private label and bulk wine in the United States. And now I think we're going to have a bit of a discussion. Okay, so I'm actually playing the role of moderator as well as speaker in this. Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to ask myself any questions. It's quite, it's, except, quite, it's quite hard to moderate one person, isn't it? Yeah, so I've, I've got to keep him in. Line. I don't know, I was thinking, should I, should I ask myself questions, on, except existential ones, what do you ask yourself? Um, so, Andrew, how do you see the evolution of private label in your market? Do you think it's at it's stasis or it's got room to grow? Well, we, we've... If, if, talking about you know the area of um, uh, celebrity endorsed brands within online, um, it's a very different subject to the one I talked about. I mean, I was talking more about I exclusive label and uh, a buyer's own label than private label in that in that strict sense. Um, I, I'm not so sure that um, I'm, I'm very dubious about celebrity brands in wine, but I, maybe I, I need to just sort of um, get over myself and um, <laughs> take my wine head off. Um, and we, 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 in, in, the, in the virgin wines envi environment, we've tried a few things. Uh, they've tried a few things. Sometimes I, I feel like I work for them, so that's why I said we. Um, they, they, there was a product called Vino by Varna, which... Um, ah which was a, a lady called Vana uh, Kutzmusis, I think she was called, who came third in The Apprentice. And, um, and she, just, she decided that her business project was going to be um, a grapefruit-flavoured French wine thing. And um, 
she she went to see um, went to see Virgin Wines and said, "I can't tell you who won The Apprentice. Um, I can't tell you. I'm sworn to secrecy. But you really should stock this stuff." And every, I think everyone thought, "Oh, oh, okay, she's going to win." So they bought it, and then she came third. And um, the, the, but the issue was was that the, the you know she was well known on television at the time, and people liked her. Um, but the, the the truth of it was is that the product didn't stack up. In, in the environment, and people, I think, realise that at the, pri at the price point that it was at. I think there's actually still some there now. Um, so it's not, it's not aged especially well. Well, when, I, when I'm talking about celebrity wines, I'm talking specifically about the US market. And these wines have flown off the shelves. I mean, I, I actually was so appalled at Cameron Diaz's um, wine Aveline and the claims that she was making that I wrote a story about it in The Guardian. Um, and, uh, and and the, the story got picked up by a lot of other media. It got quoted in Washington Post, New York Post. And so there was a lot of pressure from that one media thing. <laughs> it made no difference. Uh, in fact, the, the wine sold so well that it's now got extra wines um, added to it. And they're all private label wines. And so because of that, I think a lot of very famous people have seen the opportunity and they're all leaping in. And in the US market, it works works really, really well. I mean, there's, there's a couple in the UK um, that... that that have that have happened. Um, one is the Graham Norton uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Obviously, that was the wrong horse to back, given what's happened in New Zealand. Um, and the other one is the Philip Schofield box wines. Um, but um, yeah, I think it, I, I guess it, I guess it. I mean, it, it's not something we can talk about in general in general terms because they're all very different. These things and um, it, it, it's. Uh, I, my, my, my experience of, of celebrities in marketing wine are the kind of mini celebrities we create around, around winemakers um, in, in these online platforms. And, and people do lap that up very much, um, which, is, which, is, which is encouraging. I, I can only tell you what I'm seeing in the market. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just describing what I'm actually no, no, seeing. No, no, fine, fine. Yeah. Um, but in, in terms of, in terms of uh, moving into different varieties and different uh, winemaking, how much do you think consumers have changed in what they will accept? Are they actively looking for new things or is it that when you present them with new things, they're much more willing to try them? It's, I think that um, people are uh, sometimes a, a need a bit of a nudge to try something new. Um, but I, I, have, I have felt in the last year that, that people are a lot more open-minded when it comes to wine, wine style and um, trying new things than we would have previously, previously given them credit for. Um, it's, it, it, it surprises me to, on, on the online platform how sometimes a wine that you don't think will um, do particularly well that is quite out there in terms of how it might look or, or how, it, how the style is does really, really, really well. Um, so I think I think people are um, that there's people are open to new I, new ideas, and I think online it gives give, does give people that nudge because when you get the email or or you look at the web page, you've got all these reasons to buy, and you've got um, people telling you that it's a, it, it's it's a smart thing to purchase, and people go, okay, I'll give that a go, um, and then also there are on you know it, it's quite. It's not a very convenient thing to go shopping. I mean, we're not all lucky enough to have um, a beautiful wine shop full of stock, full of wonderful wines. And, and the, the online um, wine retailers do have loads and loads of interesting things that you can try. And so it does attract people who have an open mind to, to wine, wine, wine buying. Okay, have we got any questions? Yes. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, because I also saw this advertisement with Cameron Diaz, I find, and also the, the, the things you said about wine, I thought, what kind of briefing did you got? What, what kind of, uh, what, what's behind, what's the story behind it? Because in the end, I think it's also not only the name, but also the quality of the wine. And uh, Andrew, you, you talk a lot about that needs to be a story told when you sell wines in e-commerce. How come the story of Cameron Diaz worked so well, I wonder, because everybody who was in wine had some comments about it. Actually, I can answer that. It's because of a very specific marketing tactic that she was using, which is called disparagement marketing. So what, what her wine is, this is slightly off the topic of bulk wine, but what her wine is, is what's 
part of a new and emerging category in the United States called Better For You Wines, where people are selling wines on the basis of what they don't have in them. So there's a lot of people now, and a lot of online private label wine clubs are doing this. They're doing things like testing for pesticide residue, and they will say, um, our wines don't have any pesticides in them. Are you sure that all those other wines you're buying are free of pesticides? Um, and Cameron Dyers was part of kick, kicking off that movement where she said, um, I like drinking wine, but I discovered that there are all these terrible chemicals and additives in it, so I've created a wine that you can trust that it's clean and free of all of that. So that message combined with her celebrity is really what sold those rather mediocre wines. So for the, for the people who would have bought them, I would have imagined that the message about it not having those things in was... was I mean that if you, if you would have you would have read that message and go oh my god you know yeah. I I I'm 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 putting myself in jeopardy every time I drink a bottle of wine and here's the answer. That's right. That's yeah. Exactly what happened. Mm. Any other questions? Oh dear. <laughs> Anyone? Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. My question is to Andrew. Uh, so you've been talking about uh, what makes an online wine successful and talk about provenance and that a wine should stand out. So I have a couple of clients, uh, wine uh, producers, that uh, whose or one of their unique selling points is their social, positive social impact story. For example, if you buy one bottle of wine from them, they will make sure that uh, they supply uh, or they provide one year of uh, clean water supply to one person in a developing country. That, that's just a broad example. So I just, I'm just curious if you had any um, experience with this sort of companies online, and if yes, um, how, what, what is the reception of this kind of stories, and most importantly, does it translate into actual dollars? <laughs> I, I used Sales. to, I have a, a friend who used to be an ad man, he's retired now, and he used to say, um, you know, because engagement is the watchword all the time. And he said, um, you know, it's it's all very well to take somebody on a journey, but they have to want to go. And um, it's um, thinking to, to, to a marketing campaign, an online campaign I was involved with, where there was a wine that was, um, it was a fair trade South African wine, but on top of, of all that, it, that the project was to build a school in, um, in, in South Africa and that the, if, if the two and a half thousand cases or whatever it was was sold, then this schoolroom was going to happen. And it was, it, was a, it was a very hard sell, I have to say. And, and it's, it's, um, it's weird because you, you, can, you can sell a wine and you can say, here is a winemaker who um, is a really cool guy and he likes to eat beef and he's blended this wine because he loves to have beef with his family and this is the, the block and it's his old grandfather's block and it's uh, all of this stuff and people just can't have it fast enough. And then you say, here is a wine that can actually make a difference to people's lives. And um, it, I, I, there's, there's uh, Direct Wines is a company that... Um, I know, know from the past, um, I worked with in the past, because Virgin Wines was part of the Direct Wines group, and they used to do experiments and, and take a, a wine and put it into two different styles of packaging and market them alongside and see which worked best. And I think they came to the conclusion that an unfair trade wine sold better than a fair trade one. <laughs> um, it, not unfair, but it, it, they didn't talk about the, the fair trade aspects. It was the same commercial offer, um, but so so it's a, it's a, it's an interesting one. I, I it, when you when you go to buy a bottle of wine, um, it, they and, and you say, well, you buy you you buy this and, and someone gets clean water. Um, it's very very attractive to me personally, but I think some people might not see the connection and offered presented with the choice of either buying it or not. The easier choice is not to. I think, you know, coming from a news background, we know that people are always interested in a, a value called proximity. So the closer that 
something is to you, the more interested you are in it. So in Germany, um, when the floods happened in the R Valley, you know, the wines were ruined. They were covered in mud. Um, so what happened is a group of people picked them up, they kept the mud on them, they put them aside, and they sold them to the public, saying this will help get, you know, people in the R Valley back on their feet. And it was oversubscribed, but it's because the R Valley in Germany is everybody's neighbours. Um, if it had been, do you want to buy a bottle of flood wine for somebody in you know, some other far-flung country. It doesn't have that value of proximity that would make you care. I mean, we're working in areas in, uh, in a lot of the wine that's, uh, that we're filling in bulk, um, all of us, is coming from countries where there is quite a big divide between the rich and poor. And I think, from my own perspective, I, I think that the best way, as, as someone who's, who's responsible for uh, uh, many millions of litres of wine getting sold, the best thing I can do is to make sure that we pay the right price for these wines so that the producers that we're working with can actually put in place the things that are going to make people's lives better, just as standard, as a matter of course. Um, and that's, that's a principle by which I've always tried to live in this industry. Um, I mean, when you, when you go into a winery and, and beat people up to the rock-bottom price, um, you, yeah, you get your wine, but someone is going to pay the price. That's a very interesting point. When you, when you walk around here at this fair, there's a difference between people who are selling wine at, you know, a dollar a litre, and then if they sell it at 20 cents a litre and it goes up by one cent, they tell me their customers will, um, uh, you know, say, I'll, I'll buy from somewhere else. Do you see in the bulk market that prices are rising or that producers are getting better deals for their, their grapes? Well, price, prices are certainly rising, um, but I think that's... Um, that a lot of the, the um, raw materials that go into wine production at, at all levels are going up in price. Um, but, but people, um, the bulk wine industry has been very good at um, generally improving quality and then latching on to um, what the market will permit in terms of allowing the floor of pricing to rise. Um, and and it, it, it's, um, I mean, it, it was... There was pricing uh, many years ago that, that, that was just way too low. I mean, you, look, you looked at it and go, South Africa being a fine example, where you could scoop up stuff for like three or four rand a litre. I mean, no one can make any money at th three or four rand a litre. And, um, of course, people were very happy to buy at those prices. So it, it, it pleases me, actually, when we can get a bottle of wine onto the shelf at a, at a price where there's room for everybody to make money and everyone to be okay, and, and, and then the consumer gets a great drink as well. Oh, that's good to hear. So, since, so if you had to sum up how things have changed in terms of price and quality since you began in 2008, what would it be? Oh, it's, it's, it's worlds apart, worlds of change. Um, you know, we have, we have technically brilliant um, bulk producers now. Technically, we, well, they, they existed then. Um, but we have we have um, winemakers operating at the very very highest levels of of, of professional uh, professionalism and with with all the all the best technology at, the, at their disposal. We have um, brilliant um, reliable loading protocols that result in great wines coming to the UK and on, on wherever they're going. Um, it, it's um, it, it, this this is an extremely it, 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 when, I, when, I was, when I started uh, working in this sector, I felt as if I wasn't pro a proper wine person in some ways. Um, and in fact, in the early days of wine fusion, we started put we put in an agency portfolio, Chris and myself, because we thought, oh, we've got these po we've got these posh wines that makes us proper wine merchants now. And um, now I'm I'm very proud to be part of an industry that is that is so technically excellent. And um, um, so innovative, it's um, it's brilliant. I mean, oh, the, the 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 title of Mark's presentation, you know, because being sustainable is just the beginning. I mean, I think the bulk industry is on a is is it's not at the beginning because we've all come a long way down this road. But there's so much more that we can do, and we're in a really really good place. Sounds like a really positive note to end this on. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, sure. Uh, I was just going to ask a point about um, talking about digital technology. Um, how important is it for wine producers to kind of offer, say, connected packaging and that kind of thing? If they're going to sell online, do they have to kind of do the whole technical journey? Uh, 
No, well, um, the, 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 the short answer is um, no. Um, I mean, I, you, you mean, you mean um, the, the producer actually supporting the product with the technology that enables the engagement to happen online? Um, the, the, the online retailers I work with are very keen to um, develop and control all of that themselves. Um, it's not a prerequisite at all. I think it's um, what people are, what buyers are looking for in, in these businesses are really good wines that, can, that deliver and then they can provide the bells and whistles and, and the things that they need. All right, on that note, I'll say thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, and it's been a pleasure and thank you very much. It was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.